Welcome to the Geek to Geek podcast where things are getting spooky. Maybe. Ooh. Maybe. I'm Void and I'm here with my co-host Beige. Scary. <laughs> Today we're talking about horror and <laughs> I gotta warn you up front guys. <laughs> I, this is a topic that's been on our radar for a long time because Beige loves horror and I do not. And uh, so we can talk about our history with horror right up front like we normally do but <laughs> the thing is i don't really have a history with horror i think it's dumb and boring it's just it doesn't do anything for me like sometimes i actually like like some of the settings and the premises like i i like vampires and werewolves and like you know zombies and mummies and like any of that kind of stuff it can be cool and i have no problem with the setting it's just the execution like okay horror it, it doesn't do anything for me and i've tried lots of different kinds of horror you know psychological physical like the gross out slasher stuff yep and i i've never really gotten anything out of it i just it's so slowly paced and yes then in the end when you do get a payoff i'm like that's what i waited all this time for seriously i wait i wasted all of my time waiting for that conclusion that's dumb and okay i i just I'm not a fan, but you wanted to talk about it and you want to try to convince me to try to get into it, right? At least for part of it. That's this is something and I think you like me enough to try. And I'm really hoping because that's how I got into horror. Like I grew up hating it. Like I was pretty much the way you were. Like I was I thought it was dumb and boring. I didn't understand why anyone would want to watch a doll coming to life and killing people. I didn't get Nightmare on Elm Street. My friends loved it growing up, and I would watch part of it at their house. It was on TV in October, and I was like, oh, this is really dumb, you guys. And I was a very frightened person, though, growing up. I was very much scared of everything, the dark, uh, the ideas of just horror messed with me. And then when I was in college, my friends made me love it. They were all into horror, like they were all in when it came to horror and so i had this group of like a dozen people who would get together and watch horror movies and they would go to the video store and rent the yeah this is how long ago it was we would go to the local video store and rent vhs tapes of of just horror series and we would rent the entire series of these bad horror movies and watch them all in an evening order pizza and just sit in one of our living rooms and just talk and joke and have fun while this stuff was on tv and it was that community that made me love it that more than what horror actually is it's how it makes me feel because it's very comforting to me which is almost kind of creepy and kind of sociopathic i think in that i watch people being dismembered and i feel ooey and gooey inside because it makes me feel connected to my friends and that community there but so if see, that makes okay. any kind of sense but the thing is if you have the right group of people any activity can be fun like that exactly does, that doesn't make the genre good or interesting it just means that you have a good group of friends that you are with like that doesn't that doesn't convince me you got to do more okay, so the, the thing is no i should interject here a little bit because you said that like the the scary part of it was one of the things that held you back from horror initially yes and that's not it for me like it doesn't freak me out you know i i don't get scared that's not the reason that i don't like horror it's it's really the pacing and just like i get so bored waiting for something to happen when i'm yeah. watching horror or reading horror or i mean the the closest i got to enjoying something like that was playing until dawn a few weeks ago when i rented it from right. gamefly and even that like i could tell it was a good game and like the core underlying structure of it was really cool but it, it's just like there was not enough payoff fast enough for me like there's just no pacing to it to i don't know do you know what I mean? Like, I, yeah. I need something more to happen more often to keep my interest up. And that's something that horror has as a general rule. It's not fast paced. I mean, it's trying to build up to these things. And, you know, part of that in my mind is trying to get you to put yourself in that position because things that don't Things don't happen that quickly to people. Things build up over and over again. And as we move forward, that's when, you know, we we actually start feeling something. So that's what it's trying to do. And 
maybe you just haven't found the right works yet. I mean, that was something that I like slasher movies far more than, say, exorcism movies. Like, I just don't care. When it comes to exorcism movies, things like uh, Poltergeist, The Exorcist, all this, it's like, I don't care one little bit about it. But you give me Friday the 13th or Sleepaway Camp, and I love that kind of thing. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I've tried a bunch of different ones, so... uh... It's not like I haven't tried. I have tried because I know right. that so many people love horror, especially this this time of year. I mean, this is why we're talking about it now. Right. You know, October comes around and people start talking about it again. So I always think about it. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I know you kind of had like a horror overview here you wanted to yeah. cover, right? Can you, you said that you almost like adapted one of your lessons from teaching. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. So y'all are going to have to bear with me. I'm going into teacher mode on this. So not too much. Uh, like, like I said, teacher bear with light me. mode. Yeah, teacher light mode, because I taught a senior level English class a couple of years ago. Goodness gracious, it's been five years ago now that I think about it on horror literature. And it was basically a a survey for English majors that went. I started it at Mary Shelley and I ended it with current modern horror that may have been Stephen King, the last one. I can't remember exactly what the very last one that I did, but generally the entire gamut of what's considered modern horror I didn't start with the very, very beginnings of gothic horror and gothic romance, but that's uh, but that's where my background on this comes at. I did a lot of research on it and, and taught this class. So I'm pulling a lot from that in order to try to just explain to you, the not, not even explain to you, but try to get you interested in the basis of it. And, you know, one of the things that I think is the most important about horror, one of the things that drew me into it once I actually started researching it, is that... It doesn't matter what you alone are afraid of that, it, you know, you may not have a lot of fears. You may not have a lot of insecurities. But one of the things that horror deals with more than anything else is the idea of cultural and societal fears where you're looking at things that affect society, that that a lot of times horror will look at the downfall of a particular culture that you look at at a civilization with this post-apocalyptic horror that's very big right now. And you can trace what people were afraid of across the last century by looking at the various kinds of horror literature that you see in Mary Shelley with Frankenstein, that people were afraid of technology coming out, you know, things that science was moving forward way too quickly. You move into Lovecraft, and that was during the modernist period where everything was falling apart with World War One, and you have this idea that the world doesn't make any sense. There's no order to anything. And so his elder gods were a big were a big aspect in terms of chaos and anarchy. You move a little bit forward with that into the 60s with uh uh, Romero and The Walking Dead and you start seeing this idea of mindless people because they're they were being compared to hippies and the way that they were stoned all the time and they were affecting society that way. You move into the 80s with when you had a lot of punk and there was a lot of gang violence and drug violence that was going on where you see that was when slashers really took off was in the late 70s and 80s where that kind of violence, just just over-the-top violence, was very much what people were afraid of in general. And so they were using this as a way to deal with it, to where now we're looking at things like The Purge and The Walking Dead, where these are not necessarily about the events. They're about the people that they're going on, about the end of society or where we're going, because people are so affected by the idea of America going away, of of the entire world economy breaking and, you know, zombies coming in. And The Walking Dead's not about the zombies. It's about those people and how they deal with this kind of world. And The Purge as well, where you're looking at, you know, what happens if we have this kind of world where, you know, we all have these kind of cravings, but we're given this one night to do this. And it talks about what good people and bad people are, because that is something that is very inherent to our society right now. And these help us deal with and work through these problems and issues and what's interesting to me as a scholar is looking at it from that cultural perspective to be able to 
to understand where the where the world was, where that kind of world consciousness was. And even in the 50s, and I miss the 40s and 50s when I was talking about it, because you have so many things that dealt with radiation, and the bomb was dropped in Japan, and so you have a lot of horror that dealt with these giant mutant monsters. You have things that are coming in from outer space that, that you can't understand, these things coming in that dealt with a lot of the nationalism and xenophobia that was coming in to different parts of the world that uh, with aliens were acting as a metaphor, that horror is used a lot of times as metaphor, like I said, for dealing with these societal fears. Yeah, and like that part of it I can appreciate. Like the academic side, like if you were to give me a really interesting paper on the topic you just covered, I would read right. it and find it fascinating. Like I don't disagree with any of the things you just said. And that it's one of the reasons that I actually really like sci-fi because sci-fi right. is in, in the same kind of vein – um, you take where society is and you project it forward based on yes. the current state of the culture. So when you go back and you read sci-fi from the 50s and 60s, or like I really like reading Heinlein because it gives a yeah. like, very interesting look at what they thought the future would be like, or even going back further to like H.G. Wells. You uh -huh. know? Um, but it's the same thing. So like I can appreciate that part of it, but it, it doesn't mean that I want to actually like sit down and experience different parts of the media from the genre. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to... Yeah. Just because that's true, and just because it's interesting, because it is true, and it is interesting, I still don't want to sit down and watch a horror movie. <laughs> like... See, and to me, that's where a lot of it comes for me, is that I want to see this. I want to know how these people reacted to it. Like, I gladly and, read about it after. Like, if someone else wants to right. go and do the studies and, like, dig into the psychology and the cultural standpoint of these things, I will read about it and be fascinated, but I don't actually want to go back and then watch the movies or read the novels that they read. Like, I'm just, I'm not interested in it. Well, one of the other things that you can do is that horror elements are adapted a lot. That this idea, like you said, with sci-fi, this happens. And I love sci-fi horror, too. Like the movie Event Horizon, I absolutely love because it takes the elements of horror that I like, this, this kind of cultural, you know, what's out there fear, and puts it in a setting that I really like. And because of that, because of horror existing on such a level as, you know, that cultural level, it's a, you're able to pull that out and add it to other genres. That in a lot of ways, to me, there is no particular horror genre, because a lot of what we think of as horror, this dark and stormy night, like you said, vampires living in these castles and werewolves and the the the, the moon uh, and all of these kinds of of elements and conventions that's technically gothic romance where you're dealing with all of those things that that a lot of people don't look at horror the traditional horror as what it actually is and kind of project it on there where the characters in these in these shows are kind of blank slates i can't honestly name to you any characters from any horror movie that I've read other than the villain. I mean, they're all just archetypes out there to be killed and and, and go through these horrible things because people want to be able to use this as a way to put themselves in that and experience it in a way for themselves. And there are writers who, you know, deal with that more successfully than others. I think Stephen King is about the people. The reason I read Stephen King are because he writes characters really well. A lot of his ideas are very cliche, but the way that he handles them are super, super well done. Um, that's why The Walking Dead is successful. I mean, it's an ensemble survival drama that just happens to have zombies. You know, Battlestar Galactica is a military drama that happens to be in space. I mean, it's taking these elements of things that we could like and just dropping them into a different setting. And see, I did like those two. Those are actually two things that I guess if you would classify them as horror, I did enjoy. I, I liked when I read the Walking Dead comic when right. Rob from the comic box gave me um whatever like the full collection was at the time when we were in college mm -hmm. together in when we were roommates living together um i read all of the walking dead that was available up right. to that point the comic not the show and i really liked it and then i was oh, super good yeah i also I, I really liked um the walking dead season one the telltale game okay and i mean that's that's horror i guess you could yeah say. it is and then 
um, Battlestar, if you're going to call Battlestar horror, I suppose. Well, but, I don't really say Battlestar horror. It yeah. has elements of horror in it where you're feeling something for these people and you are horrified at what happens. And I'm going to get into that in a minute. But yeah, I would say that there are elements of it that draw on that same kind of cultural fear as The Walking Dead. I mean, even though it's a military drama, there it pulls in the same kind of emotional connection that horror does. I wonder if there are any other like kind of side sci-fi horror movies that I hadn't thought of as horror that I actually like. Um, have you seen, it's either called Moon or The Moon. It's like a Sam Rockwell no, movie. No, I haven't seen it. Uh, it's one that I've always wanted to watch. And I know the twist and everything that happens with it. You know, I know the big reveal, but I've never seen it just because I haven't had an opportunity. It's one that I've never rented or had on anything that was on demand. And like, I mean, I've appreciated Alien also yeah like alien isn't a movie that i go back to often but yeah it is one that when i do sit down and if i'm in the right mood to watch it i do like it it's a good movie and i can appreciate yes. it for a lot of reasons a lot alien of it comes down to like a... filmmaking but also and it does yeah and so it's very well made everything about it is well made but it is a straight up horror movie the only you can look at that and put it in a house with all of that going on and say that it is a demon instead of an alien and it is a straight up horror movie it is just genre swapped which is why i say that i don't think that you don't like horror you may not like the traditional kind of elements of horror you may not like the set dressing of horror but i think that you may like the stuff that you know you're actually supposed to connect with emotionally because if you like the walking dead then and you like the comic which is i think the comic is way better than the show i stopped watching the show but i would read the comic right now somebody handed me all the books because it's just so freaking fantastic yeah and i could see that being the reason i mean i do have a tendency to not like like things in general that are set in the real world because yeah when i when i'm like going and watching movies or playing games or when I'm consuming media, I want something that's different from real life. Yes. You know, otherwise, what's the point? So the fact that so many horror movies and things are set just like there's some kids in the real world and they go to a cabin. Yes. It's like that. That doesn't do anything for me. And see, for me, like Cabin in the Woods has enough of a sci fi bent from the very beginning that it doesn't feel like a traditional horror movie to me. It doesn't feel like Cabin Fever or The Hills Have Eyes. It is something so different from the set, from the outset that I get drawn in even more than I do traditional horror. Because I'm like you. There are a lot of horror movies that I just roll my eyes at every year. It's like, oh, I know what this is going to be. But then I see one that is doing something so new that I have to watch it. And a lot of them are taking the traditional set dressing that you dislike and just slightly twisting it, making making it grotesque, where the grotesque in terms of a literary uh, definition is taking something normal and twisting it until it is only slightly unrecognizable, that you still see the, the reality in it, but you also kind of look at it and go, Oh, huh. Where, as opposed to grotesque being like, it's gross kind of stuff that a lot of people are using it. And so I like grotesque horror, where it takes reality, twists it a little bit, and then throws you in, like The Purge, like The Walking Dead, that kind of thing. I would consider those grotesque. When you were saying that there's like different kinds of horror too, right? When you come down to classification. I look at the main two as being physical horror and psychological horror that everything can be broken down into those you are either afraid and i say you as in the audience member uh not are afraid of the character's physical well-being they're going to get stabbed they're going to have their head cut off they're going to get shoved into a dryer and you know burned to death whatever it is they are going to have this physical reaction that we as an audience member cringe at that like saw and hostile are like this where you saw two has one of the most cringeworthy scenes in it for me and it's not somebody getting their leg cut off it's not somebody getting caught in a furnace It's at one point there is a pit full of needles that someone picks up one character and then throws her into this pit of syringes. Gross. And I, yeah, it's gross. Yeah, it's awful. Those kind of things just, just like, I don't see the appeal at all in watching something like that. It gets super ooky is the only way I can put it, where that makes us 
feel that for those characters and and that's just kind of horror that that and and i'll get to that in just one second because stephen king does a really good job of defining horror horror and terror and then there's that idea of you know you're afraid for these people's physical well-being and then there's movies where you're afraid of their psychological well-being where they're the unreliable narrator where there is the idea of by the end of this movie that something that there's a twist and it's not a twist to mess with you it's a twist that you have had no idea what this entire narrative is about and then you can rewatch it and see how everything adds up where it's a storytelling mechanic and probably my favorite one of these is called high tension that is a fantastically gory movie don't get me wrong you're gonna watch it and there's physical horror in this where you're like oh man look at that and then at the end of the movie you realize that you are had that as an audience member that you had absolutely no idea what was going on and you question your own perception of what you were watching and so that's one the other way of looking at horror is from the psychological am I going crazy perspective and is this character going crazy and can I trust anything that I'm seeing yeah and you know I've liked some movies that are kind of more along those lines but I right. I think that most of them are not primarily horror I suppose you could lump them in and I'm trying to think of examples because a lot of them are like thrillers yeah. that would deal with this where you have the, the genre of psychological thriller where you may have something like the game or or even the born movies with uh, born ultimatum, all of this with Matt Damon, those have a psychological horror bent because you identify with him, and they're thrillers generally. But there's that memory aspect that we're all scared of, of not being ourselves. Yeah, and I think I think you're right. I think I like the psychological thriller, not necessarily psychological horror. I guess right. I don't. I'm not as well versed in like the definition as you. I'm trying to feel it out here as we're going along, but I, I right. think I'm mostly getting it. But Stephen King, yeah, did the yeah, best you said that Stephen this. King had like, like a breakdown, right? He wrote a book called Dance Macabre, and it is absolutely wonderful. And if you guys haven't read it, go read Dance Macabre. YouTube Void, go read Dance Macabre. It is a nonfiction book that was just him. It's a treatise on horror. There are two of them that I think are fantastic. Dance Macabre by Stephen King is awesome, and The Supernatural Horror and Literature by H.P. Lovecraft is fantastic. It's very much a, a peer, uh, piece of its time in the early 1900s, but both of those are fantastic just treatises on horror nonfiction. And Stephen King talks about, you know, it's a very often cited quote of, I seek to horrify my audience. If I can't horrify them, then I will terrorize them. And if I can't terrorize them, then I'll go for the gross out. I'm not proud. And I mean, that's a bad paraphrase of it, but that's the, the general idea of it. And so he says, sets out three ideas of horror and how he writes it. There is horror, there is terror, and there is this gross out. And each of them, I think, are, it goes down a hierarchy of literary worth and horror being the most important way and most fundamental way that you want to reach someone emotionally. That, think about the idea of being horrified. I mean, you're, I'm not horrified at the idea of someone getting dismembered. I am not on a primal level. Just it's not a horror to me. But if I think about starving children, I'm horrified that people in America go hungry at night. I'm horrified that people in other countries don't have clean water. To me, that simple, and I don't even want to say it's simple, that singular idea is horrifying that it destroys me mentally that it destroys me emotionally that that there is so much homelessness it is horrific that people have to deal with this i'm not terrified of it i don't think it's going to happen to me but horror is a fear for other people is the best way that i've been able to do it i am horrified that something will happen to you or if you get into a car accident i'm horrified for your family it's I don't have any personal connection to what's going on. It's not happening to me, but I am scared for other people. And to me, that's what horror is. That's what Stephen King tries to do with making you care about these characters in his books, that he's wanting them to be people that you are afraid of for this situation. 
Right. And, and so like, grossed out is pretty like straightforward. I think we all yeah. know what that is without doing examples. But what's the middle one then? What's like terror? Terror is when you're terrified for yourself. Terror is when you can put yourself in that position and you get just like you get those jump scares that the lowest form of terror is when the horror movie is really quiet for a while. It's really, you know, you have somebody walking through the house. It's they're looking to the left and there's nothing in the room they're looking to the right and there's nothing in the room but bam it's all of a sudden a cat jumps out of the cabinet and it's like oh that was lame it's like i jumped i got scared because it was loud there was there was a crescendo there was a yell there was a going on but i wasn't i i got you got a reaction out of me i was terrified for just a second and then everything went back to normal it feels so cheap That's, you know, it is cheap. Like, that is a cheap scare. That is why I say it is the lowest part of it. But also there's the terror of being thrown into a, a pit of syringes where I am. I am terrified that if I got like taken is horror. Like I am terrified that if I ever had a daughter, that would happen. I mean, my father-in-law, my wife went to New York and my father-in-law was terrified that that was going to happen. Like he just kept working himself up into a tizzy that she was going to be taken while she was in New York. And it, that affected him emotionally. And so just the idea that this would happen, or I'm terrified as I walk down a dark street at night that I'm going to get mugged or something like that where i'm not horrified by it it's not going to hit me in the gut and make me clench my you know my gut and vomit but it is that that kind of ah scare when somebody walks out in front of you but when like, you hear when a, it comes a bump to a in the movie, night it just feels so cheap when they do that like it when does. there's jump scares or when it's a lot of the time it's like just um a music cue and if you yeah, just mute the movie like it loses all impact and, every bit of it and it's like okay this is just a shot of like the woods you know like it's yep it's all down to the music and it's it's so cheap to manipulate you that way and i just and that's what that's what horror is it's manipulation i know like, that's why I, stephen I, king puts it below horror in what he's writing that terror is he's actually terrified me before i was reading duma key it's not often that that horror let me put it this out first it's not often that horror actually terrifies me that a book gets me to where i have to put it down but duma key by stephen king did because it was terror i was sitting reading this with my back to a window in my old 90 year old house alone hearing creaking and it was a ghost story about people about these ghosts coming down the stairs these creepy little girls coming down the stairs or coming up the stairs i can't remember and just the way that he described it i was not horrified but i was terrified that something was going to come through the window at me and so i put down the book and laid down flat until that feeling passed <laughs> where that that's terror i mean this was you know, duma key hasn't been out but like five or six years so i mean this has been recent i I was in my late 20s when this was going on, and it was – that's how it, it terrified me of that. But I was never emotionally affected by it. I was physically affected by it. Yeah. So you you were telling me that, like, all of it's supposed to lead to – catharsis right yes and for those of you who don't know about catharsis i mean i've heard i'm sure you've heard about catharsis and that something was being cathartic but aristotle is the one who who coined this term again i'm getting into teachy mode and when i teach aristotle i teach poetics poetics by aristotle was the very first literary analysis where he was looking at poetry and drama and just the idea of looking at what's worthwhile in literature and he came up with the term catharsis that the reason we watch anything the reason that we consume media in any form is to have an emotional purge that we have to feel this that we feel it through the media that we consume so that we don't have to experience that in real life that that for you media is an escape so that you see something completely different that when you watch these sci-fi movies you feel as though you're not longing to be in outer space anymore you know look at gravity with Sandra Bullock and George Clooney and I can't remember the guy who did it what was his name who directed that uh it's not Guillermo del Toro it's Alfonso Cuaron and when he did this it made me purge the idea that I may ever want to be in outer space that I was like 
I'm good because I was holding my breath when she couldn't breathe. That kind of thing. That that during moments I was like, <gasps> I was like, <gasps> when she breathed again, I let it out. And there was just this idea of watching horror that you know, especially slasher movies. I think, especially movies like Saw and Hostel. For those of us with these like really sociopathic tendencies, we see somebody putting a drill through yeah, someone no, else's no, no. knee. To, no, no, no. You don't need to give the examples. People, people know what Saw and Hostel. And I don't need right. to be grossed out. We're okay. <laughs> We get what you but mean. But that's, yeah, when you see this stuff, you don't have to go do that to somebody else. Now, you don't have to stalk somebody through the woods. You're experiencing that second hand. And if you are watching it in the right mindset, in the, the cathartic way, you leave that theater without the emotional and, and really almost subconscious need to ever do that. And so that's what i think horror does at its most most basic level is allow us to deal with the fears that we don't know that we have or just deal with the desires that we don't know we have that if you watch the purge and you have this one night of lawlessness you know you are dealing with that in a way that is healthy and safe as opposed to lying awake at night wondering you know what's our society going to come to you know where are we going you know what's going on the world is so terrible and but you just watched this movie where you visually saw it you felt it through this catharsis that you can go home and and expect to live your life and that you don't deal with that anymore because you've already dealt with it and i think that is horror's purpose really is to help us deal with this stuff i could i could see that i still don't want to watch most of the horror movies out there i just i don't know they yeah they mostly don't appeal to me but i know that you have recommendations for listeners you have some things you wanted to hit right yes okay so i love slasher movies i my favorite things are my two favorite kinds of horror outside of sci-fi horror i'll pretty much watch any sci-fi horror you put in front of me whether it is speculative fiction that deals with vampires in the future or uh you know uh event horizon or gravity is uh is horrific in a lot of ways where just that could happen that's interesting i didn't think about gravity as a horror movie but i really liked gravity maybe i just like sci-fi ones that have like a horror bent to them i just don't classify them that way i think of them as sci-fi i think that you like horror elements like i said i think you like the emotional feeling from it more than you like the actual you know genre conventions yeah, that, that are hit on and so for me i like slashers though i like the halloween movies the nightmare on elm street movies and friday the 13th movies that i i think they're fun i don't take them seriously and i understand how ridiculous they are because they're so over the top i can sit and just watch them during halloween and be like hey, look at that he got he got impaled and it's like i just go on about my way and i'm not affected one way or the other by it and uh i also really really like uh horror comedies and um i'm gonna actually have to google it because i can't remember the name of it well like i like Shaun of the dead and i'm sure you put that in this category yeah i did yeah and that's i mean i don't really see that one i mean i know it's a horror movie but it's more of a comedy i guess in my mind than anything else yeah it is. I mean, it's a comedy movie, but again, it uses that kind of um, those kind of conventions to, you know, to deal with those kind of societal issues of society breaking down. And what if you're not good at killing zombies? You know, what if you are these kind of schmucks like are in this movie? How do you deal with it? What if you are Simon Pegg? You know, all of us are way more Simon Pegg than Daryl from The Walking Dead. And so that's what it's dealing with. And it's funny because we would all die in the zombie apocalypse. Let's be honest. Let's be honest with ourselves. I mean... Horror comedies are fantastic because they know exactly what they're doing. They don't take themselves seriously. And that is my favorite kind of horror that does not take itself seriously. Um, There's a movie called Santa's Slay that's a Christmas horror movie, which is a subgenre that I don't know if you've ever watched any of. But Santa's Slay is ridiculous. That it is just dumb. And we did a screening of it at the public library last year, I think. One of my friends did. And it was ridiculous. Santa Slay as an S-L-A-Y, not (laughs) S-L-E-I-G-H. And it is, it's dumb, but it's fun to watch because it's so stupid. I want to see Krampus this year around Christmas because it's a Christmas horror movie. Um, My Bloody Valentine 3D. Okay, have you ever heard of this? Do you remember this movie coming out years ago? I think I've heard of it, but I don't 
I don't really know. Okay, this movie came out years ago, and I don't, I don't know what year, but its previews were dumb. Okay, like everything that you say about horror, this is your worst nightmare. Okay, it is dumb and boring and cliche with vapid characters, no real plot, and just gore just out the wazoo. Right. Okay. And so I love it. I absolutely love it because this movie was one of the first horror movies that it was a remake of an old movie, by the way. And it was a remake of a horror movie that was taking advantage specifically of the ridiculous 3D technology that was super popular when it came out. Like it was made for 3D and it's dumb that I mean, there are pickaxes being thrown at the screen and them latching into it and showing breaking glass. This movie knew exactly how dumb it was and it went over the top with it it is so much fun to watch because you know that the filmmakers had a good time making this movie and that's the kind of movie and music that i like if i know that that an artist is having fun while they're singing i'm gonna get more into that album if i know that a filmmaker or an actor is having fun while they're making this movie i can get involved in that you know i told you that's how i know that i like video games because i like the people that you yeah. can tell that with movies too like i'm really much i'm really into that kind of thing in terms of the creative process and my bloody valentine 3d watch it in 3d if you have the opportunity you guys because it is i mean it is not safe for children don't get me wrong most of the movies that we're talking about here are not safe for children but it is dumb that it is just stupid and i love it for that but my absolute favorite my absolute favorite horror comedy is sleepaway camp I don't even know how to describe it. It's a parody of Friday the 13th that is the least serious horror movie I've ever watched. It sh- it tries to take itself seriously in the way that it is very tongue-in-cheek taking itself seriously. It presents all of this stuff as a very realistic possibility of someone being away at camp and, you know, having to deal with all the, you know, the serial killer, but it is just super fun and the way it's it's there, there are all of these different gruesome deaths that it has in it that are in absolutely no way possible or plausible. And you look at it as like, seriously, that's what they did with that? It's like, all right, that's fun. And because it's so over the top that it becomes funny at that point. And I really love it. So those are my favorite movies. Do you, do you like any horror movies like that outside of Shaun of the Dead, horror comedies that you've ever enjoyed? Nope. All right. So, what about books? How do you? Sorry, <laughs> I, I wish I had a better. I wish I had nope. a better answer. Like, no, I just I don't like horror. No. I get I get really really bored with it. Or if it's going for the gross out, it just doesn't appeal to yeah. me at all. But like, that's I don't understandable. Know. I just maybe yeah. you like books. Then okay, have you ever read a horror novel? Uh, I don't know. I what would you classify as a horror novel? I've read a lot of books. Okay, have you read any Stephen King, Dean Koontz, or Joe Hill specifically? And these are not the only horror writers, and there are better horror writers out there, but these are three of the most mainstream. Yeah, um, I've tried Stephen King, and I just I don't like his writing style a whole lot. Um, All right. But I, I have read, I've read a bunch of Dean Koontz. Okay. Did you like any of Dean Koontz? Yeah, some of them. Some of them run into the pacing dumb horror issue that I always have but yep. other ones other ones enough happens and it moves along at a good clip and I can get into it now that's why I was going to suggest him for you because he writes way more psychological thrillers than he does straight up horror right yeah that I like that a lot of hit A lot of his stuff is very fast paced. There's a book called, I think it's Velocity, where it is just moving from one point to another. He wanted to write a book that never stopped and there's no downtime in it. And I like that a lot. I I think pacing is really the biggest turnoff from horror in general for me is that like it there's so much slow just like they're trying to build yeah. it up and i instead of okay building up tension i'm just sitting there getting more and more frustrated and bored all right so do not read it okay it is probably my favorite horror novel but it is massive i mean depending on the version you have it's going to be 800 pages maybe and the problem with it is that it by stephen king by the way it is 
very slow in parts because it is building up a personal connection between you and these characters. There are lots of flashbacks. There are lots of, it takes place with the adult characters, but you're also seeing their past that led them to the point where they currently are. There are times where it is incredibly slow paced, but it is also one of the most intense, emotionally intense novels I've ever read in my life. I did some of my master's work on it and it is it is a phenomenal book that I will never read again because of the pacing, which is a problem, and how intense it is because I got way too affected by it because of how much I cared about those characters. Okay. Do you have any other book recommendations that might actually be okay. like more up my alley? <laughs> Heart-shaped box might be. Um, it's a ghost story that I haven't finished because it scared me. It is Joe Hill, which is Stephen King's son. Um, horns and heart-shaped box are way faster paced for horror. That they start off, you see what's going on from the very beginning, but they're still character based. Um, heart-shaped box. I was reading in the dark while my wife was asleep, and I was lying in bed beside her. And like I said, we lived in this old ninety-year-old house, and I would hear creaking, and there was just this. The way that he writes is super scary. I just stopped. Like, I scared myself, and I stopped reading it because it was... Joe Hill starts a book, and it's kind of like Dean Koontz in that it's not a thriller, but he moves everything forward way better than his dad. That's good. That pretty much anything written by Joe Hill you might like. I really like Horns and Heart-Shaped Box. I've heard great things about Nosferatu as well, and he also wrote a comic called Lock and Key that they did an audio version of that was free on on Audible that I don't know if it still is, um, but I don't know if Rob has read any of it, but ask Rob about Lock and Key, and that may be something that you could get into as well with Joe Hill. Okay. Um, with Dean Koontz, my two favorite Dean Koontz novels are Phantoms, which was a Ben Affleck movie, by the way, um, <laughs> okay. which is from Kevin Smith. Kevin Smith always had this really fun line from uh, Jason Mewes in one of the books where it was like, yo, Affleck, you to bomb in Phantoms, yo. And it's always so funny to me because Phantoms was kind of a weird movie, but the book is great. It's about genetic engineering, and it's basically a sci-fi Cujo is the best way to put it. It's like genetically engineered monsters who are smart or genetically engineered animals who are like super smart and there's a team that has to take them down. It's a horror thriller that you might like. It's one of his older books. And then you might also like uh, Dean Koontz's Odd Thomas. It is... Okay, have you read Odd Thomas? I might have. I might actually have read Phantoms too now that you're telling me the premise. That sounds familiar. Okay. Odd Thomas is my favorite thing. It's one of my favorite books. When Jennifer and I were dating, she got me a signed copy of Odd Thomas and gave it to me as a gift. And like, it's on my shelf that, that I just adore this because Odd Thomas is about the character Odd. He sees dead people. I mean, before The Sixth Sense and Haley Joel Osment did, Odd Thomas saw dead people and they're detective novels. They are him helping the police solve these these ghosts who talk to him, they, he tries to help solve their murders and bring them justice and letting them rest and go to the other side and all of that. But it is presented in a way that there are horror elements that are horrifying that the things that are happening like he has to stop terrorism plots there are he deals in one of the books with like supernatural called brother odd he deals with supernatural uh kind of ghosty demon things in a monastery but they're all at their heart detective novels where he's dealing with this and it is about odd and the reason that i like it is because he is a legitimately good person that Odd Thomas is, and I know we'll talk about this in a little bit when we get to our geekery, but I have to touch on it. Luke Cage is a good person. The Flash, Barry Allen, is a good person. And I like stories about good people. Odd Thomas is a good person person and he wants to help people and whether they're alive or dead and his biggest goal his biggest aspiration in life is that he is currently working as a fry cook he is perfectly content there but his aspiration in life is to become a tire salesman because everybody needs tires. You get somebody good tires on their car they're going to walk out your door happy and you know that you've helped them for the day. 
and they're living a better life because you helped them get good tires. And it's like, I love that idea. And then all of a sudden there are ghosts and solving mysteries in there because of with this good person who is not like a detective novel, this kind of gruff, rough around the edges, his girl Friday kind of noir. No, it is Odd Thomas, who is a nice guy, fry cook, who wants to sell you tires, solving mysteries. Yeah, it doesn't sound it's like my great. kind of book at all. Like really no not at all that sounds so boring so boring and it sounds you like would, it's mostly set in the real world with elements thrown over it like the fry cooks it is. and now, tire salesmen like no no you're losing me here okay okay you gotta that's right move on. but maybe games, the listeners right? want to listen to it maybe the listeners like odd thomas maybe. okay the secret world is the best horror game in the world like i love it and the reason that i say it's the best one in the world is because it takes all of the set dressings that you don't like and it combines them into one game you would hate the secret world like okay. you would hate it so much but our readers if you are our readers my goodness our listeners out there you guys need to go play the secret world it's a buy to play mmo that i play as a single player game that i go through the opening area is a lovecraftian seaside village where you can fight cthulhu in one of the dungeons um you're solving mysteries you're doing this there are are haunted hotels there are haunted woods with native american spirits in it there are i'm currently stuck in the ridiculously boring sasquatch country um i i know there are you go to egypt and you get to deal with the horror that's placed that comes from the middle east you get to play in a transylvania setting there is a tokyo based japanese horror which japanese horror and korean horror are their own genres we are talking about american horror here if you want to really get into some weird fun horror look at japanese horror movies and korean horror movies they are just awesome um the thing is one of them just go watch the thing and and they're dealing with this in the secret world. Like there are areas and zones that deal with all of these and it just combines them. They're haunted amusement parks that you deal with. I mean, there is everything in this game and it's all put together so seamlessly that all of this is under the surface of the real world and you would hate it. So don't even give it a try. Like you would hate everything about it. Yeah. I, I um, have enough other people online that like this game that I know that, right. um, it it's, seems like it's a really well done MMO if you're into the yes. kind of thing that it's presenting. And I'm just I'm not. So I never actually went and played it. But yeah, it seems like if you want like a horror based MMO like that is a really good one that's out there. I've heard enough about it. And it's story based like the quests and stuff. You you go one through the other and it's the only MMO outside of Star Wars, the Old Republic that I have cared even a little bit about the story. That's cool. So there's that. Um Resident Evil has to be mentioned. Um, I started with the Resident Evil series when it was brand new. I got the long black box of Resident Evil for the PlayStation 1. It was it scared me. I wouldn't play it when I wasn't around my friend. I never played this game alone. It was a lot of jump scares, and it still is. So many but, jump scares. Um, Those dogs will get you, man. Yep, the dogs. I remember the dogs. I fell off my bed, dude. Just fell straight off my bed when that dog jumped through the window. Um but if you're the Resident Evil games are currently still being they're still being made they're they're really good right now they've moved from the slow paced old games into more of an actiony over the shoulder kind of fun yeah it uh, kind of, shooting type game they made that shift with like Resident Evil Four where it became Four. more modern yeah. yeah which is cool but I mean it kind of falls in with like Silent Hill and Fatal Fatal Frame like they're kind yeah. of in that same genre if they feel not all that different right which i know there yeah. are other ones on your list too like yeah they the, are the more modern resident evil games are much more closer to like that triple a actiony type thing uh-huh but the older resident evil games are much closer to that like slower paced kind of investigating exploring silent hill fatal frame type of thing yeah. and i like those kind of games but the weird thing is nowadays i don't like playing them i like watching them that if I watch somebody playing a horror game, I am I am just tickled pink. I will sit there and I am happy as a pig in mud. It is so good. And there's the Southern coming out. Um, <laughs> I love it, but I don't like playing them. That like I watched one of my buddies play through The Last of Us, which is definitely a horror game. I mean, it's a post-apocalyptic survival See, horror game. I like The Last of Us, but not for the horror elements. It's just an interesting story. 
you care about the people. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. If you can invest in the people and you find the horror that is that is based around things that you do like, I think you like horror elements, like I said, because The Last of Us is undoubtedly horror. It seems like some like light horror elements mix in with genres and situations I actually like appeal to me, but when you go like yeah. to the straight up horror movies games books or whatever like i just every time you're describing them and i'm I'm glad you're giving recommendations because listeners i'm sure listeners will jump on some of these but like all of these ones that you're describing that are more classic horror like the more you talk about them the more i'm sure i do not want to spend any of my time on them absolutely and that happens i mean i went through after i taught this class after i taught uh, English 424, I didn't watch a horror movie for four years that I got so burned out on just the idea of horror that I would not do it, that I couldn't bring myself to, that I was the only, the closest thing to horror that I could get was my, my wife and I got married on Halloween, by the way. So, har- so Halloween in October is kind of our time of year. And I wouldn't watch horror movies, but I would watch all of these silly things like Ernest Scared Stupid and Hocus Pocus and stuff like that, that has the same horror elements, but they're taken to a you know the kids level that they're not extreme they, they become funny they become quaint they're fun where horror doesn't have to be scary horror just has to be enjoyable and it has to be enjoyable for each of us for a different reason one of my favorite things in the world one of my favorite horror pieces in the world is the garfield halloween special that it is an animated 80s cartoon that you can watch on YouTube right now that I did last year, and I'm going to watch it again this year because it's fun. You watch Halloween Town, and these are horror movies, but they're Disney Channel horror movies where they take these same elements of horror, but they do something weird with them. And that may be my recommendation to you is don't close your mind to horror. You know, don't watch stereotypical traditional horror movies and if they come out in october they're going to be very traditional horror movies that you they are appealing to that audience who goes to haunted houses they're appealing to those people who want this gory traditional set dressing with the vampires the zombies that are gory and gross and try to scare you and try to terrify you What I suggest to you is looking for things like The Last of Us, looking for things like Battlestar Galactica, where, you know, Battlestar, the reason that it's horrifying is because every single credits, the number of of humans in existence wound down. They had that whiteboard. That is not terrifying. I'm not afraid of that ever happening in real life and happening to me during my lifetime. But the idea of that is horrifying on a visceral level. Yeah. I like that. I'm horrified about that. Battlestar was cool. I mean, it dropped, it kind of dropped the ball at the end with the ending of the series, but like the whole show leading up to it was really good. I liked Battlestar a lot. Just great. Just so I, I don't think you should say you don't like horror. I think that you might not like October horror. I think you might not like the mainstream horror, but I think that you like the elements that make it work. I think that you like the constituent parts that are taken out to make other media better. Okay. I can see that. I can see that. I will keep that in mind going forward. I have one thing I want to say, by the way. If a movie comes, if a horror movie comes out, in January or February, do not see it. It is terrible. It didn't make the cut for October. It wasn't good enough for the summer blockbuster. They are just pushing it out to get it on DVD and video on demand by the middle of the year. Just avoid it. They are 99% of the time terrible, and they're not even the fun terrible. They're just straight up bad. So if you see anything that you think, oh, maybe that one would be fun, don't watch it void just don't do it <laughs> even just just even if you think it's gonna be fun even if it's a sci-fi horror you're like hey that'd be fun maybe you know beach said that was gonna be don't this is good to know ne- never had a good one <laughs> okay cool with that it's probably time for our weekly geekery where if you don't know it's what we share what we've been geeking out about this week um i've been playing more more gamefly stuff as it's coming in kind of using it as a demo service odin sphere has been interesting because it kind of holds what up what is that it's it's like a it's a really pretty 2d action hack and slash okay. game but uh, it's like a vanillaware game i don't know if you've ever played oh. any of those it's japanese but it's 
like it's beautiful yeah. like it, when you see it in motion it looks really really good so i played a bunch of that that was cool and okay. um i tried like mario and luigi paper jam um i grabbed one of the zeldas i rented because i wanted to try the hd remaster of twilight yeah. princess for my playthrough which Ugh. is cool it looked nice and the controls were better but I, I still i'm not a huge fan of twilight princess but yeah i mean um mm-hmm. gamefly's still been good and actually you set up you set it up right yeah you set I up did. a gamefly offer thing for listeners which is awesome so we've never tried doing sponsorship or like affiliate or anything before but if you guys want since i've been talking about gamefly for like a month and a half now if you go to gameflyoffer.com slash geek you can go and it's like a free trial or something that they can get right yep Okay. Yeah, it's a free trial. You get your free month, and we also get compensated for it. So if you want to help support the podcast, it is GameFlyOffer.com slash geek. There you go. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. So the main thing, the main reason I was interested is to get you guys a free month of it because I've been talking yeah. about it, and I know a lot of people on Twitter are like, oh, I, th- I think I want to try that. So now you can for free for a month, which is pretty sweet. I still I love the service. But yeah, so I've been doing GameFly. Um, still been playing through Zelda and like i'm really really glad that i let myself do a light playthrough because i'm realizing that i'm really not a huge fan of 3d zelda like okay i'm playing back through wind waker is amazing it's still one of my top zelda games but all of the other 3d zeldas going back to them i'm constantly disappointed and it's really really sad to say that because when i went back and did my final fantasy project and replayed the entire series it reaffirmed my love of final fantasy and it it just like solidified how much i love that series in my mind and i thought going back and doing the zelda playthrough would do the same thing and instead Uh it's the opposite it's making me realize that i don't like the zelda series as much as i thought i did and it's hard it's hard to say that but um in learning that like i'm i'm not a huge fan of the 3d zelda games after i play through that game once like I just don't yeah. want to replay it unless it's Wind Waker because I like Wind Waker. Um, yeah. uh, the 2D Zelda games are really good. Yeah. Like, That's actually one of the reasons that I liked Ocean Horn so much yeah. is because it played like a cheap knockoff Zelda, but it played like the 2D Zeldas, even though it was 3D. And so it was just super fun to play. So I, I, I'm the same way. I love the 2D Zeldas. I can't wait to play Link Between Worlds. Yeah, so I think one more week and I'll have actually kind of finished my whole light playthrough. I have a couple of the last games that came out in the last couple of years here left, so mm. I'll talk more about that next week. But the, the main takeaway for me from this week is that I hate gimmicky controls. I hate yeah. the touch controls on the DS games. I hate the motion controls on well twilight princess you can get the hd version now so you can actually play with the real control but the first time i played twilight princess i hated those motion controls and when i when i tried to play skyward sword this week i hated the motion controls like i'm just not a fan at all in positive things that i actually did like (laughs) this week uh i resubscribed to marvel unlimited because there was like a deal that either you or rob tweeted it out but there's i think it was me yeah because i got an email about it yeah, there was some deal where like you could resubscribe to Marvel Unlimited and it was really, really cheap. So I did that. Um, I haven't actually read anything yet, but I'll probably get back around to it this week. And then I started doing a play by post for like a D&D game. Yeah, because one of the people on Twitter recommended it to me and I've been wanting to like get into the headspace to play D&D in uh-huh. real life. And I never played enough of it consistently to like really solidify the rules in my mind. Like I, yeah. I listen to a lot of live play like podcasts or YouTube mm-hmm. shows or whatever of D&D. So I, I understand the rules, but it's different when you actually sit down and play it. So yep. I'm doing this play by post on it's a site called Gamers Plane. So if any of you All are right. interested, it's a really, really nice site. It's a very welcoming community. And you can just jump on there, make an account. And a lot of the time they'll be like, hey, looking for new players, you know, or newbie friendly. And you can jump into a game. It's cool. So I've been doing that. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. That's really fun. And then... The last thing was Luke Cage. I watched all yeah. of Luke Cage in like two days. Like I watched it really fast, wow. but it was really good. I liked it a lot. And you watched it too, right? I'm watching it. I wa- I've watched the first four episodes and my wife and I are taking it slower than we did, say, Jessica Jones. But it's also Halloween and we're decorating and doing things like that. We had to watch Halloween Wars. Oh, my goodness. That's that needs to be one of my geekeries. I just I just geeked out about it. So I think I should. <laughs> what is Halloween Wars? 
Okay, Halloween Wars is, okay, it is a Food Network show that is a baking competition that has pumpkin carving, cake sculptures, candy making, and the just decorating in all of these competitions to make the best Halloween-themed food. Like, the, the stuff that these people come up with is insane. That they're, they're on season six now, and you can get all of them on Amazon Prime, and we have watched all the seasons. We watched the first four seasons seasons like in a week they're cheap they're like six to seven dollars a season if you don't get hd so we watched all of these through and we just love watching them like we don't really like competition reality shows but it's halloween themed so they come on sunday night on food network every week in october there are four episodes a season and like it came back this week and i'm so happy like that's that's why we haven't watched as much luke cage we would be at least one more episode into luke cage but halloween wars came on sunday and we had to watch it on monday that actually sounds like something that my wife and i would really like we like I think you guys like would like it. Baking, cooking, competition shows a lot. Um I might Go have check to check that out. I might have to check I know that, that out. I know that the first episode of season six is free uh on Amazon Prime right now. And so you can watch that one. But the first season I do think has the first and second season have the best artists on there. All of them are fun. All of them are good. And these people do things with food I could never do. But you guys would love the first couple of seasons at, at least like you may binge all of them like we did because we're crazy Halloween people. <laughs> well, I binged all of Luke Cage because I was in the right. mood for, you know, the Netflix Marvel it's MCU. So good. It was really good. Yeah, I liked it a lot. I watched. Um, I think what happened was I wrapped up all my client work really early that Friday. So I watched oh, like okay. 10 episodes that Friday while my kids were at school <laughs> and I was done with work. And then um, on Saturday, I watched the last three or however many there were and okay yeah it, it was really good i liked it a lot um i thought i mean everybody would rank the marvel mcu differently and yeah i i don't think any of the marvel mcu shows are bad i still think jessica jones is my favorite and then right underneath that for me is daredevil season two and then very close behind that is luke cage um and then daredevil season one is kind yeah. of farther down for me because i didn't really right. love the pacing in it but I watched the whole thing and I can easily see how Luke Cage could be anybody's favorite show. Like, yeah, you can make an argument for I that and I would believe it. And I, I totally could see why, you know, like it just depends yeah, on who you are as a person and what you like from your TV shows. That's exactly the way I feel about it, too, is that even four episodes in, I can totally see how this is going to be somebody's just favorite thing that the MCU has done. Oh, yeah. And yeah, for sure. Because and, and for me, I really like it because, like I had mentioned earlier, Luke is a good person that watching all of this, like there is a core to Luke Cage, who is a person who wants to help other people and do what's right. And that's what I actually liked about Jessica Jones. But Luke knows how to do it. And Jessica doesn't. And so it's just a completely different dynamic of what I like in the Netflix MCU, where that's what I like about Daredevil, that Matt does the same thing. And I just haven't gotten far enough in there to see how he handles it because he handles it wrong at first. And so I'd like to see how he does it later yeah, on. I really like where Daredevil gets to with season two, um, especially right. because the villains in the Netflix MCU play such a crucial part. Like if yes. you guys haven't watched any of these Netflix Marvel Cinematic Universe shows yet, the the villains get just as much screen time as the heroes which is really mm -hmm. different from the movies where the movies your bad guy is just kind of a bad guy and their yeah. motivation is usually i need a glowy thing or something yes. that's very simple <laughs> yes. like that you know except for loki but he's an exception um but he still had a glowy thing the, the netflix marvel cinematic universe the villain and the hero like they tie together in such an integral way that the villain gets just as much screen time as the hero does and it makes sense and it makes for a better show so when you eventually get that conflict it feels like it has more impact in a way and what is interesting to me and i can't say this about Kilgrave and jessica jones but what i've noticed so far in luke cage and daredevil that fr from what i've seen so far is that they are relatable villains in that their motivations aren't, like you said, to get glowy thing. It is 
to that they have legitimate motivations, that there is something that is driving them as a person to do that, as opposed to something that is MacGuffining them as a yeah, villain. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we're not going to spoil any Luke Cage here in our weekly geekery, but I'm pretty sure that this week's The Comic Box with Rob is probably going to be all about Luke Cage, I think. I was probably. talking to him about it earlier, and... um. I think he finished it, and I think his whole episode this week will be about it. So if you haven't subscribed to that one yet or checked out the comic box, go over and get on his feed because I'm sure he'll have some thoughts about Luke Cage. It'll be interesting. I would like to put out one not really spoiler, but my favorite thing in the entire series of Luke Cage so far in the first four episodes is him actually being in the old 70s Luke Cage outfit and just seeing that made me laugh so hard. Yeah, that was funny. Because in real life, it is hilarious. (laughs) What else do you have this week? Okay, I, after last week's episode, it couldn't have come at a better time. I played Pandemic. The night after our episode went live, one of our couple friends ended up inviting us over to their house to have a board game night, and they had Pandemic. And I thought we were going to play Ticket to Ride so that Jennifer could be a train baron and see how that went, but we decided to play Pandemic instead. And oh my goodness, you were right. Pandemic is awesome that it we won. We did the four Epidemic cards to have just the normal game and we won with three turns left that with three cards left in the player deck that we cured all of the diseases and so we we had a really good time doing this and it being a turn-based strategy game was so fun because we could talk we figured out what we were going to do we planned out different turns and everybody was talking about you know we were discussing what the best way to do things were to fly back and forth and it was just super fun like you guys go out and try pandemic i think it's 25 dollars on amazon right now that it is if i don't buy this game i'm gonna borrow it from james and jessica again so that we can get to the point where we're comfortable enough to buy pandemic legacy and that be what jennifer and i do together like that's what i'm pushing for right now because i enjoyed it that much that's awesome no i'm i'm really glad especially after recommending it last week i'm glad you got a chance to try it like right after we talked about it because yeah i do think pandemic is one of the best games out there right now and if you could if you could play it just a couple more times to where you're comfortable enough with the base game, you can uh-huh. definitely you'll be ready to jump over to Legacy and then really experience that too. Like I can't even imagine Legacy because that just sounds so much so fun. And I have one question about it that you kind of touched on last week. Yeah. There's not necessarily a story in Pandemic. Is there an ongoing story with Pandemic Legacy that you unroll unfold? Yes, and it's Okay, cool. It's not like a this huge driving narrative, but it's um yeah. it's like a situational story if that makes sense. Okay. Like your objectives yeah, just, are yeah, your objectives are changing for story related reasons because right, um, okay. without spoiling things, like the the way that the diseases are interacting and the way that the world is changing as it goes mm-hmm. on. Um, it, it kind of makes a story, but you make the story by playing through it, you know? Okay, like, that's what I thought that yeah. you would say. That's what I inferred from it, but I wanted to make sure that, that... I just wanted clarification on it, really, because there wasn't necessarily a narrative. It was just like, hey, these are some diseases, do this. And uh, I was like, cool. And with Legacy, the way that you had described it, made me think there was at least a, a partial narrative. Yeah, there is, for sure. And uh, also, I wanted to point out to you guys, I got an email from Blizzard the other day day that they have partnered with Twitch Prime, twitch.tv, that if you have an Amazon Prime account, you can get a free Hearthstone hero for your priests. That's Tarand and Tarand Whisperwind. And I did this. I haven't even played Hearthstone. But the way that it works is I'm going to include a link in the show notes that you can also check this out if you just Google Twitch Prime. You go sign up for Twitch. You have your Twitch account. You log in and you basically log in on both your Amazon Prime account and your twitch account you link them together and then you have a give me my loot button you click it and it gives you a code that you enter into your wow account it's like redeeming any other code for uh, world of warcraft on BattleNet. so it's a couple of clicks and a code redemption i know it made it sound more complicated than it actually is but you link your two accounts together and you get a code to redeem it is super cool she's like a golden hero like all of the other premium heroes she's got all the wispy you know animations around her so uh she's really cool 
this also made me jump on Heroes of the Storm and get my free Turand hero off of that. Just because. I was like, why not? It's Turand Day. And uh, so I got that. But yeah, y'all should definitely go do that. I don't know how long it lasts, but I know that as of this episode going live, or as of the recording of this episode, and I'm assuming that it's going to be when it's live, y'all go do that and get a free Hearthstone Hero if you play. I think um, I was reading about this because just kind of gaming news in general. Um, They basically said that you know, if you have Amazon Prime, you get Twitch Prime for free because mm-hmm. Amazon bought Twitch. That's why they're doing all this linking. Oh, I didn't know that. That's yeah, cool. Yeah, that's that's why this linking is happening. So if you go and you link your two accounts, it sounds like you might get loot every month going forward. Oh, which cool. Is pretty cool. And I know you get one free subscription with it as well, that Twitch Prime includes one free channel subscription to a paid channel. So, so if that's your thing, you know, freebies are freebies, y'all. Yeah. Cool. I think that'll about do it this week. Um, you can always write to us with comments, suggestions, or feedback. Our email address is geek to geekcast at gmail.com or reach us on Twitter, which is the better place, at geek to geekcast We also have longer discussion threads on our subreddit now, which is reddit.com slash r slash geek to geekcast And we're having some pretty good discussions there, actually, uh, so you guys should definitely drop by, even if you're not a Redditor. Um, we also have a new website put up that uh, you may want to check out at geek to geekcast.com which has a link to all the shows in our network and you can also sign up for our email address for our email address for our email newsletter there uh, to get email updates about any of our network's podcasts just sign up and let us know what shows you want updates about I blog almost daily at agreenmushroom.com, and you can find me at GRN Mushroom. That's Green Mushroom without the E's on Twitter. And I'm on Twitter as at Professor Beege, and I host the Geek Fitness Health Hacks podcast, uh, which lives at geekfitness.net, and I've got science fiction and steampunk novels at bjkeaton.com. We've been Void and Beege with your Geek Geek podcast. That'll do it for this week. See you next week, geeks. Ooh, spooky bye. <laughs> sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha!